What's up and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. This is your host, Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us today. This episode is powered by Stick and Ball TV, the baseball and softball streaming platform. If you're a coach with a growth mindset, you don't want to miss out on the daily videos that Stick and Ball is putting out with some of the greatest baseball and softball coaches on the planet. Check it out on the App Store or on stickandball.tv. On today's show, we have on Tanner Reclitus. Tanner works as the Director of Operations at Tread Athletics, and he also writes a weekly email newsletter for coaches called Monday Morning Edge. And let me tell you from personal experience, it will have you thinking every Monday morning. His work is focused on helping coaches succeed in the 21st century. Previously, he worked at Driveline Baseball and was a minor league pitching coach for the Los Angeles Angels. So on the show, we discuss the systems approach, power laws, and the what, why, and how of coaching. Here is Tanner Reclitus. Tanner, welcome to the show. Jonathan, thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Oh, absolutely. I am really excited to get to interview you today. I know that I am a, uh, a very avid, I, I, I don't know if you could be an avid subscriber, but I guess an avid reader of your newsletter that you put out on Mondays, which I highly, highly suggest for our listeners to go in and, uh, and check that out because I'm actually going to put that in the show notes too, just to make sure that they have access to it. But you are working with Ben Brewster over at Tread Athletics in North Carolina. And so tell us a little bit about your transit transition from being a professional baseball pitching coach to now a director of ops and just kind of walk us through, I guess, really the last year or two of, uh, of your career. Yeah, no, I mean, thank you for the support. I, I, you know, really appreciate your support as well as everyone else who reads the newsletter each week. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, and, and just really appreciate, you know, you being along, uh, every single Monday morning on that. Uh, as far as my journey, man, I would say this is going to sound kind of weird on a baseball podcast, but I would say my journey kind of really starts or like this version of my journey really starts uh, December of 2018. My wife and I got married and uh, a month later, I accepted a contract with the Los Angeles Angels to be a minor league pitching coach. Uh, did that all 2019, signed my contract uh, back up for 2020. Uh, January of 2020, uh, my wife and I moved down to Arizona. We were going to live there kind of full time. And as we all know, yeah, about two and a half months later, the world completely flipped uh, and, and not really able to, uh, you know, just life changed. And uh, with that, you know, we, we had to make some decisions. Um, ultimately, just for for various reasons, decided to leave the Angels uh, and, and now working with Tread Athletics. So uh, I think this is our fourth state. Yeah, fourth state we've lived in uh, kind of like on a full time basis. Since uh, since we got married just over two years ago, which has been crazy, but I think a lot of baseball coaches uh, can can definitely empathize and and, and resonate with that. But uh, you know, now at, at Tread Athletics, you know my my role is director of operations. So what that looks like is building out the systems that can really support uh, our you know we're now up to nineteen uh, nineteen full or part time employees. So what does it look like? to empower all these employees to coach as many athletes as we have uh, to to really do great work. Uh, so to kind of eliminate all of the back end, just kind of like administrative stuff that they have to work on and instead that they can actually go out and get the best results possible uh, with our athletes. So my day spent, you know, really focusing on system development, really focusing on, you know, building out things like standard operating procedures uh, and and ultimately just like freeing up time for guys uh, so they can go out and, and do what they need to do as, as far as getting our athletes a whole lot better. So one of the one of the things that you mentioned that really perked my interest, you talked about systems and the systems approach. And I think, you know, over the last couple of years, it, it's really, that's been one of the words that consistently stands out to me. And after reading Urban Meyer's book, Above the Line, a couple of years ago, he just talked about how average leaders have quotes, good leaders have a plan, and except, exceptional leaders have a system. And so he and and Timothy Kite, who is Brian Kite's dad, Tim and Brian are both both fantastic uh, guys to talk about systems and different things like this. But they wrote the book Above the Line, which is you know what what I was just uh, referring to, where the quote came from. But anyway, so 
tell us a little bit about, so you were on the field with the angels and then you, I don't want to say you're, you're not on a field now because you do help coaching coach coaches and, and set up systems for them. But let's, let's rewind back to, uh, just the systems approach. What have you found to be just some things that you've learned or some advice to coaches or just some, maybe some hiccups that you had to overcome along the way and just give us some advice for more coaches who want to develop like a systematic approach to coaching. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And I'll, and I'll be honest, I haven't read Urban Meyer's book uh, to know kind of how he thinks about systems. Um, so if this doesn't really align with with where he's at, you know, that's on me. I should I should probably go ahead and read that book. But yeah, no, um, no, no, the way that I think about systems, <laughs> the way I think about systems is, uh, especially from a kind of like an operational context, is what can we do today to make the future easier? Uh, so I think a lot of times coaches get stuck in these very like redundant cycles where we just do the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, I remember when I was with the Angels, and, and this was kind of no fault of anyone. It's just kind of the nature of playing a you know as long of a season as we had, and even though it was short season, it's still it's still kind of like the same game being played out night and night or night in uh, night out. So writing a post game report, right? It's like how many how many ways are there for me to say the guy like d- did a good job, had good feel for his pitches, and like spun a breaking ball well? Like, there's not that many ways that I can creatively say that so that it's different each night. Uh, so while I didn't solve the problem there, you know, we we think about things at Tread a little bit differently from a systems development uh, standpoint, where. You know, I think a lot of coaches, we kind of like really pride ourselves in the programs that we write, for example. But I think the question that, that we often ask ourselves is like, well, what's the differentiating factor? And it's like, is the differentiating factor in program writing or is in communication and problem solving? And, you know, I think we tend to lean more on the side of, well, the thing that differentiates like really elite coaches is their ability to solve kind of like higher level problems. You should be able to systematize programs for, you know, I don't know, 80, 85% of general problems. And then that gives you kind of space to operate uh, uh, and allocate like attention to the, that remaining, you know, 15 to 20% of problems that might be outside of your normal experience. Because as much as, you know, as much as players are individual, players are also pretty similar in their issues, especially as they've played baseball or played a sport for, you know, 10, 15 years, they tend to develop similar asymmetries, uh, similar compensation patterns, all these different things. And it's like, well, why do we keep solving the same problem when we could just set up a system right now that we don't need to continually like solve this problem as if it's entirely new every time? Are you with me on that? No, I love it. And, and that's that's kind of the the journey that I've been on the last couple of years. And, and I think you know, really with anything in life, for me, everything is a kind of a pendulum swing. So what happens is we are doing something wrong. And so we, we want to correct that and we overcorrect that by going to the other side, all the way to the other side of it. And I think individualization is one of those things. And so like you mentioned, I, I like for players to have autonomy. And I think that that's that individualization piece. But I also think that like you said, there are a lot of similar problems for a lot of similar people doing a lot of the same things. And so how can we, I love the the way that you put it, how do we allocate our resources to the truly, you know, the, the very fine, uh, fine things that we're trying to fix the, or whatever it is, whether it's motor pattern or whatever. Uh, but I really like that approach to it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that, you know, individualization has taken like a whole different like term from what it was supposed to, because what, what, you know, and, and you're younger, but what would happen like for our older generations is everybody would do the exact same thing all of the time, all of the day. And it would just like, there's no autonomy within that. And so we pendulum swing to the other side of where it's like, we get, you know, players that are 12 years old, standing on BOSU balls, trying to catch different colored baseballs with different colored while trying to breathe through their (laughs) eyelids and calling that individualization. Uh, but I I'm with you. So just like, are, are we are we kind of on the same thought pattern with like a lot of the stuff can be like we can I don't want to say cookie cut but it's like we have a system for these players and then whenever they are having a problem with X Y or Z 
if it doesn't fit in that box, then it's like, okay, now let's go to work doing something specifically for you once you've reached a certain threshold or, or whatever. Uh, and this doesn't work for you anymore. Yeah. I, I mean, I think what we're getting at here is that it, like an individualized or customized program should solve the individual's needs. It doesn't need to be completely novel, right? Like an individualized okay. program doesn't mean that it's completely new and never seen before. It just means that it solves the individual's problems. And those like those two things kind of seem like they would be the same thing, but they're not. Uh, because once you've kind of figured out protocols that solve problems, you shouldn't need to reinvent the wheel every time. Like you shouldn't have to reinvent that protocol just because a new player to you or a new player came to you with the same problem set. You should just be able to like, hey, this is working in the past. And I think we all do this intuitively, but there's this this kind of like deceptive allure maybe of, of like the individualization idea that we ne always need to be writing new things all the time. It's like, as a coach, like I want, and, and in my current role as director of operations, you know, I want our coaches to be able to solve problems at higher levels. And I don't want them solving the same problems, you know, like Cohen McKelpin. So Cohen's our CEO, Ben's, you know, co-founder uh, along with, along with Cohen. And, and I think a lot of people are very familiar with Ben just from the content uh, you know, that, that goes out on his account, those kinds of things. But very early on, they saw like, hey, we want to be solving increasingly more difficult problems as we get more experience. And like, really, we just become, uh, we just become better experts in this space. And I don't want to be solving the same problems uh, every single time a new athlete comes to us with, you know, X, Y, Z issue. L what can we do to systematize this so that we don't have to be solving those problems in a completely kind of like novel way every time. And that was honestly really cool on them. And, and I'm able to kind of step into this, uh, step into this role and, and help advance that forward. And, you know, that's just one of the things uh, that we're doing, but I think that's one thing that is really exciting. And I think, you know, for me, just having the coaching background I do, I'm like, man, that would, that would have been so cool <laughs> to like, to have that for my, you know, year and a half with the angels uh, at, at various other stops that I've had before. Well, let me ask you this. What has, what has coaching taught you about being a director of ops and how it's, how it's helped you and what has being a director of ops helped you with how to coach? Hmm. That's a good question. What has coaching taught me about being a director of operations? You know, one of the things that I think that I go through too, any different job that I have, I'm like, Oh, this would have been helpful <laughs> if I was a coach or, and you mentioned it with having, uh, being with uh, with your former your former team of where you wished you had had some different systems that were set up. So I I know for a fact that being a coach has helped you with a director of ops because you kind of see it through from that lens. And so I didn't know if anything had come up that you've been like, oh yeah, I really like this because I can see the coach's point of view. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think I think from the coaching to director of ops point of view, it's understanding that problems aren't entirely solvable by by system systematization, right? Like you can't just systematize every problem away, meaning you can't have, Hey, here are the six buckets of, of guys that, that, uh, they fall into like, like here's the six problems that, that we can solve. And we just like put our athletes into a bucket. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, our, when we talk about systems at tread, like our systems are, are much more robust than, than just having like a limited, uh, set of problems that we can solve. Now, we're not, you know, we don't have system is we don't have systems in place for every problem that exists. But understanding that um, there are problems that exist outside of like our ability to build systems around them, I think that's one thing that has kind of gone from or helped me when I look back at my coaching and just like kind of the weird problem that pops up and it's like, hey, I could just go solve this problem, and this is such an outlier problem that. I don't need to like go build some sort of infrastructure to go solve this problem first. I can just go solve it. Uh, and, and that's really the way that things should be, it's, right? Like you should go solve the problem. And then if it's something that you can use in the future, now you kind of just like click copy and paste on what you did and, and what worked. And then you just bring that forward uh, with you into the future. Now, as far as kind of what my role as director of ops has taught me for coaching, I mean, I think it's it's fairly similar, uh, just in that, in that like, 
the problems that we're all facing, right? And and I'm I'm working on this idea that I want to put out in the newsletter, um, which is just that coaches shouldn't call themselves coaches. Uh, there's a guy named Patrick McKenzie. He's a, a <laughs> He's a programmer, like a computer programmer, but he doesn't call himself a programmer. Um, he's also, you know, he works at Stripe, uh, so the the credit card uh, processing company or the payments processing company uh, of Patrick uh, and John Collison. And he, you know, he wrote this uh, he wrote this essay that programmers shouldn't call themselves programmers; they should kind of define themselves or they should present themselves as you know, people who solve problem X. So he, you know, one of his examples was he came across this guy who on his personal website wrote that he had uh, written the backend code of which 97% of Google's revenue went through. And it's like, okay, so that guy has brought in, you know, he's written code that has brought in billions of dollars to Google. And, and like, that's a very kind of definite, like finite problem uh, that, that he solved, right? Like, Hey, I did this thing and it brought this result. And I think coaches like we we struggle to kind of like define what we do. It's like, well, I'm just I'm a baseball coach. <laughs> I'm like, well, but like anybody can be a baseball coach. Like what problems can you solve? Right? Like I, you know, I fully respect all my youth coaches, but like the the problems that my youth coach uh, could solve are nowhere near the problems that, you know, Cohen, when he was my coach, when I was a tread athlete, uh, that he had to solve when he was working with me as a 21 and 22 year old, like they're just completely different problem sets. And, and, you know, Cohen was able to do them. Uh, he's able to do them at much higher level now, um, than, you know, than my youth coach. So I just think this idea that, you know, we really want to think about what problems can we solve more so than just like, Hey, I'm a coach. I think that's, I think, I just think that's really important. Um, and I, I don't have a great, like, I don't have, uh, this like well-wrapped idea to put out in the world yet, but, uh, thanks for allowing me to workshop it right here. <laughs> no, no, I love it. And, and, uh, again, what's, it's, so the, one of the reasons that I love your newsletter is because I think that, that we, again, we, we are both coaches, uh, and we do have some similar, uh, things that we do agree on, but you think a lot differently about those things than I do. And so it always makes me like, it just gives me different things to think about, if that makes sense, as far as it's almost an economics approach uh, to coaching, I, I would say. And so, you know, for for one of the the things that you talked about, which which really piqued my interest, I've got a couple of them written down, but one of them was the power law. And so for those who mm. have subscribed to your, uh, to your newsletter and those who haven't, can you kind of describe that? Cause I, I thought that that one and the, the 76ers GM discussion that you had over him was a really, really good one. So if you don't mind, can you walk us through that a little bit? You must, uh, you must know that that's my favorite article I've ever written. <laughs> Is it? No, it was really good. Um, uh, I love that one. I, I mean, that one was fun. Um, some really cool things actually happened kind of as a result of writing that article, which is why I think that that's my favorite article. Um, but yeah, so the idea behind the power law is that, you know, we live in this world where we kind of assume everything falls on a bell curve. So it's like, Hey, here's average, you know, here's maybe one standard deviation, you know, better than average. Here's two standard deviations. Here's, you know, half a standard deviation, less than average. Right. And, and we just kind of think of the world in bell curves, but when it comes to results, uh, what actually like how it more often works is is it falls in in this this power law, or um, I mean yeah, just really just a power law curve. So if you've ever heard of like the eighty twenty rule or the Pareto principle, um, it, it kind of goes along with that. So there's you know uh, Italian man uh, some little you know over a hundred years ago, he's looking around his country and he's saying like, hey, you know, it feels like 80% of the wealth in this country is owned by about 20% of the people. And the same thing for land, right? 80% of the land is owned by 20% of the people. Uh, he noticed, you know, 80% of his, you know, apple trees, or sorry, 20% of his apple trees produced, you know, 80% of the apples in his garden, for example. Just like he noticed this, this 80-20 uh, kind of result uh, distribution happening all over the place. And then he coined it, you know, the Pareto principle, which is just the, the guy's last name. But 
What I realized, uh, I, I had read a book on the 76ers and specifically like the the process, right? So Sam Hinkie goes in as a general manager and just kind of like he, what he wanted to do was he wanted to get as many swings. Uh, so you think about each draft pick as like a swing at, uh, you know, like an at bat or just a, a swing at a pitch, right? He wanted as many swings as he could get. So what he would do is he would just, you know, trade veterans on his team for second round draft picks. He would trade, you know, he, he would just trade all these guys away so that he could get more and more draft picks. So he could get more and more swings, right? Well, when you trade away pretty much anybody with talent, what happens is you tend to lose a lot of games. So you get a lot of lottery picks. And, you know, if you've been following the NBA this year, you know, the 76ers are doing pretty well. Uh, so it, it's kind of, you know, panned out in the long run, but uh, during the process, right? So during that that three year span that Sam Hinkie was general manager, people really didn't like it. They didn't understand. They, it's like, hey, this just doesn't like this just doesn't go along with my model of the world. And I think the insight that Sam Hinkie had was that in a power law world, what you need is a lot of swings. You you need a lot of attempts. So you know, for example, he drafted Joel Embiid. Uh, he also drafted Nerlens Noel. Now, Joel Embiid has gone on to be an all-star, you know, probably a top 15 player in the NBA. Nerlens Noel is not that, but they were both drafted, you know, lottery picks very, very early. Uh, Jaleel Okafor was another example uh, who has kind of not really turned into what uh, what people thought he would be uh, coming out of college at Duke. And, you know, but, but the cool thing is in a power law world, like if you get it right one time, uh, that can make up for for uh, all of the times that it didn't work out. So so Joel Embiid and then uh, and then Ben Simmons working out actually the year after Sam Hinkie left. Uh, that was a draft pick that he had earned as well, or you know that that he had been responsible for. Mm-hmm. So you know them getting Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid kind of made up for or completely made up for you know Jaleel Okafor and Nerlens Noel not working out. So it's just this idea that like. You don't have to be right every time. You can just be right, you know, one or two times, and that can really just like catapult uh, your life. You know, for for the 76ers, it was like take them from a bot like a bottom bottom team to now they are a serviceable team that just needs more reps playing together, and you know now they're in the top top three four teams uh, in the East pretty consistently. No doubt, I love that. And thank you for explaining that a, a little bit. And anytime we can use the Pareto principle, I think that uh, <laughs> that's always an interesting discussion for sure. Yeah, I mean, the, it's, the it's, that- a, it's a really cool thing just to think about, right? And sorry, I didn't mean right. to interrupt. No, but it's absolutely. like Go ahead. in training, for example, when you're when you're working with a young kid, you can just think about like, okay, what are, what are the 20% of things that I can do with this kid? Like of every option I have available to me, like what are the things that are going to get me 80% of the results? And, you know, like, honestly, when, when you just start off, it's like, it's probably squat, do some sort of hinge, do some sort of upper body press, some sort of upper body row, just from a a strength training perspective, you know, and then there's different things you can do in throwing. There's different things you can do in movement training. There's different things you can do, you know, sleeping eight hours a day is like right up there. It's, it's a very easy thing to do, but it gets you 80, 85, 90% of, of the results that you get from every other training modality out there. So thinking of that and like, okay, what are the kind of, what are the easy things I can do that provide, you know, just massive amount of results? Uh, I mean, honestly, it's, it's pretty incredible once you start seeing the implications of of that principle everywhere. Oh, for sure. And it's like, (laughs) yeah, you start to see it all over the place, which is crazy. So you mentioned a couple of examples and that's what, that's what I was going to ask you next is like, where, where have you applied this in either, you know, in either your director of ops role or just you've started to see it more? Because, uh, again, like you just mentioned, once you start to really dig in and you start to see it everywhere, what are, what have you seen it in baseball? Like what are you mentioned squat and hinge and press? And uh, I can't remember if you if you put another one in there, but those are oh, and sleep was the other one. And so are, are there any that you would really add to that list, whether it's hitters or pitchers or just in the team setting or it just anything in general that comes to mind? Yeah. So this isn't going to be, you know, specifically on player development, but um, there's actually this idea, which I got from Sam Hinkie. Uh, I listened to one of his podcasts and he's, he just like, he drops these little nuggets in his podcast interviews. And I just like, I have to pull off the road and write them down. Cause I'm like, Oh my gosh, that is so good. 
but he just said like people are a power law and i was like oh my gosh like that is so true and you know a big part of my job at tread right now is director of ops is is hiring so it's like mm-hmm. how do we find the right people for for you know what we're doing kind of the mission we're on <laughs> and and you just have to realize that like the the right person for that job isn't just like you know two times better or you know one and a half times better than the next person like they're like 10 or 20 or like 100 times better just because like when you're when you're really trying to do something that that is is cool uh you know you really need the right people you know we talk a lot about you want to work with a a players on on a player problems and mm-hmm. you know at tread we we've kind of gotten to a point where we get to work on some pretty cool problems and to do that and to do that well. Uh, and this, you know, I'm sure this is true of a lot of people who are listening. It's like, we really need a plus players uh, to come work on this problem. And, and then the cool thing about a players and, and bringing more, more a players on board is like, once you have more a players on board, it becomes way easier for more a players to come on board. So it's this like, right. it's this like positive feedback loop where it, the more, mm-hmm. you know, really, really good people you bring on now, the more, you know, excellent people come and join your team. And, and then it, you know, then the flywheel starts going and it's, it gets pretty easy. And that's like, you know, I mentioned Patrick McKenzie before he wrote a, you know, one of his articles was on Stripe, the company he works for. And he was just saying like, yeah, just imagine a company called 2X and, you know, every year this company grows 2X and let's say you, you go back each year, uh, just one time a year because you're a remote employee and you go back to headquarters one time a year. And every time you go back, 50% of the people, like the company has doubled in size, but you like every year you don't know 50% of the people. And just like how after, you know, four, five, 10 years, uh, how many people or how many new people are being brought onto that team. And if you maintain a high kind of quality bar for the kind of people you bring on, like how good uh, that organization can be. And it's like, okay, what we're doing at Tread, like we just hired our 19th employee, but <laughs> what we're doing at Tread is nowhere near on the scale of Stripe. But it's like, what does that look like when we're, you know, 30 people, 35, 40, you know, maybe 50 people, a hundred people, if we ever get to that point, like what does it look like for that to be, uh, for us to like bring on 50 A players? It's like, that's kind of, that's like, that's a, that's one of those A problems, right? Like an A plus mm-hmm. problem that uh, that it's fun to solve. It's also very challenging. No doubt, that's that's a great example. Another article that I really liked that you talked about, and uh, it's the what, the why, and the how. And how you said that uh, this may be one of your twenty percent coaches that helps you with eighty percent of your problems, but one of the pitching coaches that you are around ha- mentioned those three things, and that we should develop a system around fixing problems and even maybe using drills uh, with those three questions. So one intro that for us, tell us about that discussion and then tell us how we can use it. Yeah. So that idea comes from Doug White. Uh, He was the Angels major league pitching coach for one year in 2019. Uh, Then before that, he was the Astros bullpen coach with Brett uh, or Brent Strom uh, before that, he was, I, I want to say, the coordinator for the Astros. He was with the Cardinals for a little bit. Um, before that, he's kind of been all over, the, all over. Uh, has done some really cool things in the game. Um, but we were at our kind of preseason meeting where we were just getting to know everybody, kind of going through organizational philosophies, all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you've ever been in pro ball, you've probably had something like that. Or, I mean, honestly, it probably goes on at every level of baseball because it should and it's important. Um, but he was giving a presentation, uh, just on like how we're going to talk to players. And he said, before you say anything, uh, to any of our players, you need to know what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And how we're going to do it. So, you know, the, what is like, Hey, what drill or, or like, what are we going to work on? Right. So let's just say we're going to work on, uh, we're going to do some sort of drill, to uh, kind of capture the hinge in the pitching delivery, for example. So the one I'm thinking of, uh, Clevenger, you know, posted a video of him kind of holding a kettlebell on his throwing shoulder and then, you know, being on a mound and then kind of catching the hinge on on his way down uh, from, from 
peak leg lift. So, all right, we're going to do this drill, right? So, you know, we're going to work on capturing the hinge or ca catching the hinge out of our, our peak leg lift. Why are we going to do that? Well, it, you know, we're going to do that because it's important, uh, you know, high level throwers exhibit a hinge uh, pattern in their delivery, but they don't, you know, it's not a forced movement. It's something that, that they more kind of fall into. Uh, so, you know, and then this gets into the why. The why is, you know, we want you to get a proper feeling for what this should uh, kind of feel like internally for you. And uh, to do that, you know, we need to do this drill. So it's just like being able to answer, you know, what are we going to do? We're going to work on the hinge. Why are we going to do it? Or sorry. Uh, no, I had that right. What are we going to do? We're going to work on the hinge. Why are we going to do it? Because high level throwers exhibit this hinge pattern. And how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to perform this drill and then you go into explaining some of the nuance and, and kind of the directions of the drill. And it's like, it's really simple, but challenging yourself to answer those questions and not just be like, Hey, we're going to work on this drill. Uh, you know, I saw it on Twitter and it looked like a good idea like that. Then you don't understand it. So it's, it's more a check on your own understanding. Uh, and if you can't answer those questions, it doesn't mean that you, you know, can never use that drill. It's like, no, you just need to have an idea so that when players, you know, when the eventual player comes up and, and says, Hey coach, why are we doing this drill? You can actually answer them. And, you know, one thing that I did with the angels and, and Doug encouraged us to do this was actually, you know, tell our players to ask us why we're doing a drill. Right. So I would, you know, we would be working on some pitch development stuff, for example. And I would, you know, say, Hey, I want you to feel, you know, this, this thing with this pitch. And then, okay. 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 And I say, okay, before you throw this pitch, you, know, you better ask me, like, why are we going to do that? And I wouldn't do this every time because then it just becomes very monotonous. It slows down the pace of, of the practice session, for example. But sometimes if I felt like a guy was just kind of too accepting of what I was saying, I would say, no, hey, why do you think we're doing this? And sometimes they would know and it'd be, okay, great, let's go do it. Sometimes it became very obvious that they didn't know. So then it's like, okay, why would we want to do this, right? So part of kind of creating buy-in with your players. And, and this is a topic that, you know, coaches love to talk about and, and we love to kind of debate the best tactics, but it's like, you want to create an understanding of the why uh, in players. And, you know, that comes really foundationally in you understanding the why and being able to communicate that why. So that's kind of the idea behind, you know, what, why, how I, I think, it seems very simple. Uh, just when I look back on it, I'm like, yeah, like, how did I not know that? But it had never been phrased uh, to me that for, or it had never been phrased like that to me before. And, you know, Doug, Doug was really good at just like compressing ideas down and then, you know, giving us the tools to, to go implement it with our players. And, you know, I've, I've mad respect for him. No, and I, I don't know, Doug. I just know that anytime you have a preseason meeting about how you're going to talk to players. I, I'm a really big fan of that. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, for sure, man. I'm with that. For sure. So with, uh, with one of the, the other things that I feel like you've, you've done a lot of digging into lately is coaches from different sports and I probably in particular soccer, it feels like you've been really getting into soccer, which there's some great soccer coaches in the world for sure. And a, a mutual friend of ours, Cody Royal, who's, who's really, really good. And it's got a couple books out right now. Uh, but anyways, I, I do want to know, like, what are some different things that you've picked up from other sports that you think can directly apply to coaching? I mean, they are coaches, but directly apply to the baseball coaches or softball coaches listening. Yeah. So Cody and I were actually having a conversation about this a uh, couple, like maybe a week and a half ago uh, about, you know, what, what baseball coaches could learn from other sports. And I was kind of complaining to him. I was like, man, like, you know, Cody coaches Australian uh, rules football. So I was like, man, uh, you know, you can just look at like basketball, you can look at soccer, you can look at you know, American football, you can look at rugby for like all this different inspiration. I was like, baseball, man, like we don't have anything. <laughs> we, we don't have any sports we can look at because baseball is just baseball. And, mm -hmm. and he was like, well, yeah, I mean, I understand that. But then he kind of helped me see how, you know, cricket, there were some things that were going on in cricket. Um, that uh, that he felt like might be applicable. Uh, but but I think, you, you know, the things that have really stood out to me have been more along the lines of kind of like communication, 
uh, styles, managing like player psychology, those kinds of things. So for example, one, one book that I've, uh, you know, I've kind of dipped my toes in and out of is, is uh, a biography on Jurgen Klopp. So he's the, uh, the Liverpool manager. He was previously with Borussia Dortmund um, from Germany. And, you know, before that was the, was the manager at FC Mainz. He's been you know, extremely successful in his coaching career, has done really great things kind of at every stop that he's made. And, you know, for him, I've just learned the importance of like including the, the overall community, right? So including, you know, the, the city of Liverpool in the team. And now obviously when you're coaching at Liverpool, the, the city is already like bought in, right? Like they just love that soccer team. So it, that's less of a challenge, but in, you know, for example, in his last season at Dortmund, the team wasn't very good, uh, but in his last game, like the, the fans stayed the whole time and like cheered him off the field. And like, he was crying after the game just because he, it was like so emotional for him. Uh, he had, he felt like he had just built up this amazing bond with, you know, with the fans, with the city, with the supporters and, you know, that, the fans of that team, they're spread out all over the world. So he's like, man, this is like a global thing and just got really emotional. I mean, it was a really cool moment, but uh, you know, with, with him, there's not much that I can like take from him tact, uh, you know, like as far as tactics and strategy and, and any of that stuff, it's more like, okay, how does he, for example, bridge the language barrier, right? So he's uh, you know, he speaks German uh, nationally, or naturally, uh, you know, English as a second language. He's he has pretty good English, um, but it's you know you can tell that it's not his first language. So you know, for baseball coaches, especially at the professional level, like you're spending a lot of time uh, working with guys who's who English isn't their first language. And you know what what can you do to make them laugh? Right? Like I've I've heard it said that laughter is the shortest distance between two people, and that's uh, you know one thing that. Like I tried to, I tried to use that and I don't think of it as like a man, like I'm going to try to be funny today. It was like, no, if, if you say something, you know, silly as a, you know, trying to speak Spanish, just make fun of yourself. And like everybody laughs and now you, you just connect with guys. Right. And a big part of it is like, you know, go ahead and like take the risk, take the risk of like trying to uh, kind of meet someone where they're at. Uh, especially when there's a language barrier and like there's so much mutual respect from that because they see kind of like you extending yourself uh, beyond your comfort zone. And as a result, now they're going to go kind of like to a, a different level to extend themselves. And hopefully, you know, hopefully you guys can connect. And even if it's through broken Spanish, broken English, whatever it is, you know, now there's this connection there that wasn't there before, you know, someone had stepped out and, and taken that risk. So that was, I, I think, when I look at other coaches, you know, I'm not super interested, honestly. Like, I'm not super interested in the way they uh, kind of like strategize or, or do that kind of thing. Um, that's that's not really my favorite thing about coaching. It's obviously important, um, but it's not uh, not my favorite thing. I really like to, to study, understand, and then like apply some more like communication uh, principles, communication ideas, psychology practices, those kinds of things so that I can like just connect with people better. Well, for me, that's the 20% of the job that makes the 80% of the impact. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the soft, I don't want, I don't even like the term soft skills, but I think that they're commonly referred to as soft skills. Just those things are the difference for me between a coach that's, that's good or not very good to a coach that's like elite coaches. Yeah. And I think there's this really interesting thing that, that's going on. And it, it, I wrote a very short article about it uh, on my site. I just called it Reclitus's Law of Coaching. And it's this idea that like we all understand and we all talk about how important communication is, but we like still severely underestimate the importance of communication. And it's just like, and when I just look around and, you know, I see, you know, coaches tweeting out things about how important communication is. And I'm like, Yes, like I, I completely agree. I'm like, but even that, it doesn't feel like we're doing a good enough job of like encapsulating just how important communication is. And Brett Bartholomew has really shaped my thinking around this. Uh, he wrote a book called Conscious Coaching. If you haven't read it, that should be the first thing uh, you read. Like, if you're looking for a book, read that book. 
Uh, and then the next thing uh, is a book that I've you know read. I've I've recommended it so many times, but it's called Alchemy. Uh, it's by a guy named Rory Sutherland. He's uh, the vice chairman of Ogilvy Advertising over in Britain. Uh, but the book like completely shifted the way I I thought about human perception, uh, just relationship, uh, just thought about honestly life in general. And it's, it, I just really think that even though we, we kind of understand that communication is important and, and like the soft skills are important, we still like, we do not do it justice as far as, as giving it, uh, it, it's true level of importance. Oh, fantastic. I am, I am filling up the resources section in your show. <laughs> so we may have not even have to go to that question later, but no, it's really good. And, and you've given me a couple, I love like Brett Bartholomew is one of my favorite guys just for the fact of he'll just, he tells you the truth. Like he's been yeah. there he, he, and he's done a lot of different cool things, but his uh, art of coaching podcast is something that, that I listen to every week and I think is really good. What, one of the other things that, that I think uh, that we really need to discuss today is just, you know, we've talked about that relationship with the player quite a bit and we've talked about, uh, and you, and you've been, you know, you've been at driveline with a lot of guys that are self-driven. You've been at tread, the same thing. And then you were in pro ball. I feel like, you know, and myself included in this is with like amateur coaches, we have a harder time getting guys to level up and own their career. And, and some of it, maybe we don't provide that autonomy for that, which then leads to motivation, which then leads to hopefully mastery at some point, but just any advice for just having those crucial conversations. And I know that you've done a ton of different research on the art and skill of communication, but I would just love to hear just some different things that, that you've learned for just like having that, that, Hey, let's, let's, uh, you know, let's level up with, with this or that. And, and let's, let's get your, let's, let's let you own your own career because the guys that are coming to you at Tread are, are, you know, they're, they're paying for the, these services. And so they are self-driven, but if we're the, and you've been in, in the team coach setting of where it's not necessarily that, that being the case, but for the amateur coaches who are like, Hey, I, I want to give some autonomy to these guys, but how do I help them through that process? It, that was a really long question for a really, really simple, but basically how do we get players to own their career? Yeah, for sure, man. And I, and I think, you know, you hit on a really important point there, uh, which is that when you work in the private sector or, you know, the private space, you know, the athletes that you're working with are paying you money uh, to help them achieve their goals. So there's this kind of like fundamental agreement, uh, kind of like mutual agreement. It's like, hey, you're, you're paying us money uh, and then we're going to help you get where you want to go. And uh, that, that value exchange uh, is actually like really, it, it's a really important like signal that that player cares. Now, when you work in the team space, right? Like if you work in professional baseball, college baseball, high school, uh, youth baseball, and it, it's in a team space where there's not really that same value exchange, that can become more difficult. So I kind of think about things on, on two different time horizons. So the, the first time horizon of like getting guys to own their career is is like you want to you want to create this kind of sense that like you as the coach know what you're talking about and especially in like this is very early on in your relationship with a player it could be literally your first interaction with a guy i mean i've had guys that i i'd never talked to him before all of a sudden like i see something they're doing i i step in i kind of like say hey man what's your name and then we just kind of roll with the conversation i say Hey, I've been seeing this thing. I've been watching you. Uh, you know, do you mind if I, you know, if I share what I'm seeing? They're like, yeah. Then I share what I'm seeing. It might work. It might not. If, but if it works, they're like, yo, this guy knows what he's doing. He can help me. I want to work with him more. Right. So now we've established this kind of like coach player relationship. And, and that can, can really like be, I mean, that's obviously very, uh, foundational towards like having this good, uh, this good relationship, helping players get better, all those kinds of things. Now, as far as like getting players to own their career over the long term, I like to think about this, uh, you know, a, kind of around the idea that we want to develop players to be their own best coaches. And that's, that's kind of a popular saying now. I, I, I've heard that, you know, I don't know, I've, I've kind of been in this thing for about six years now um, of like really kind of being, you know, t 
towards the the forefront of, of kind of what's going on and just like hearing hearing voices of, of pioneers that are are really are really pushing forward and you know I think we hear that we want players to be their own best coach and I actually I actually kind of don't agree with that and the reason is when I was in college I graduated in 2017 um, I mean, you could, you could say, and you would be right that I had quote, become my best coach, right? I, I didn't really trust, um, you know, other coaches that were around me. Um, you know, I, I felt like to a certain degree, I'd kind of outgrown, uh, the coaching that was just like locally available to me. And as a result, you know, I trusted Cohen, uh, you know, our CEO and, and my coach at Tread at the time, I trusted a few others, but I didn't really you know, trust other, other people. Uh, so I wasn't really receptive to ideas and those kinds of things. But what happened was I had become extremely uncoachable, right? Like I, I'm, I'm alluding to that. I'm not really listening to other people. Uh, I basically only trusted Cohen, but even when Cohen would say something, you know, I might kind of push back. I might not really feel like he knew what was going on. And, and I just become very uncoachable. And, you know, you get to a certain point with, with athletes where what you, what you want is not for them to just be entirely on their own where they can go solve all their own problems. Now that's obviously a good thing, but I actually think it's, it's healthy to have someone, you know, a coach typically who can provide feedback, who can kind of guide you along the path, right? Like that's really all we are anyway, but especially as you get into higher levels, like you should have a coach and the role of a coach changes for, you know, the six-year-old, the 12-year-old, the 18-year-old, then the 26-year-old, like things, things change, uh, of, of like what that person needs from a coach. But I think, especially at the higher levels of the game, what you want to create is, is, uh, like a healthy level of dependency and dependency can be good and bad dependency when it's done poorly is that, you know, Hey, I can't, I literally can't work out unless my coach is here, right? Like we've all heard stories of the guy who Mm -hmm. shows up for a workout and maybe his trainer isn't there for the day. And he literally like, he's like, I don't know what to do. I can't do it. I need him here or I need him or her here uh, to guide me through my entire workout. I can't do anything. I'm going home. That's unhealthy dependency, right? But healthy dependency is uh, this, this idea that you you want to be there and you want to always empower the athlete to help themselves, but you still have the knowledge that they're going to need for their next set of problems. And that just comes with expertise, right? You shouldn't be as a 23, uh, 23 year old grad assistant or 24 year old grad assistant. You shouldn't be expected to kind of like know all that stuff and be able to, to really do those things well. But as you get better, as you get more reps, as you, you know, see your, 1000th player, as you see, you know, as you see your 1500th player, 2000th player, uh, all those different things. And, and you just get so many reps under your belt. You, you have this experience that is so invaluable that uh, you can actually create healthy dependency. And, and one of the main things of that is like, Hey, I'm going to teach you how to do this thing. Right. So one example is, is uh, different kind of like tissue quality uh, work that you can do right? You can go to a, a massage therapist or, you know, some, some specialist to, to go take you through like active release technique, those kinds of things. But what that, what that uh, technician or practitioner should do is, is teach the person how to do that kind of thing on themselves, right? So that they actually don't need to go and, and, and continue to pay that person or take time out of their day. They can just while they're, you know, warming up for a game, they can just, you know, trigger point this certain area, do some palpations on it, go through some ranges of motion. Hey, I'm good now. That like, that's what this looks like when it's done well. But unfortunately, and, and, you know, I recently wrote an article about this on misaligned incentives is that when your entire compensation and revenue is tied up in, you know, like a lesson model where the person, you know, where your client comes to you and, and, you know, you work with them one-on-one, they're basically paying you for your time is like, you're actually not incentivized to go teach them, uh, how to do this on themselves. Because right. if you teach them how to do it, well, now you're not getting paid anymore. But as a coach, you want to be in a position where you can leverage your expertise and you can actually hand off things that you know, so that you can work on more challenging problems, right? Like you shouldn't have to be there 
to, you know, free up a guy's lat, for example. You should be able to teach him, say, hey, when you're going and playing on Tuesday, go take your buddy. He's going to put his hand here, he's, and then he's going to take you through this range of motion, and it's going to, it might not make it perfect, but it's going to make it better. And that's what this should look like. That's what healthy dependency looks like for players is that they know that you have the answer to their problem, but that you're also going to give them the tools they need to go execute on the solution themselves. So that's kind of my idea around, you know, how do we give players, like, how do we help players take control of their career? It's like, we need to be able to solve their problems and then also give them uh, the tools to go implement the solutions themselves. Man, you absolutely nailed that question. And I wish that I could add something to that, but I'm I, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just skip over to the next question because I, I, I want to <laughs> let that sink in a little bit. But no, that was, that was fantastic. And I guess the only thing I would add is when you're talking about that too, even the best players, coaches in the world included, all have some sort of mentor or feedback for them. Like they're all driven. They're all really good at what they do, but they also – we we get super hyper focused on some things and we all all we always need a reality check like one way or another so it could be like hey you're you, you know you did this in the past you're doing this wrong you need a kick in the butt whatever it is we all have a very close circle of people who help us with those things so i think you nailed it uh, and i i, I don't want to you know soil the question anymore or the answer anymore <laughs> by adding to it but i thought that that was fantastic yeah. And I mean, I'll, I'll just add something to that. That's one thing we talk about at Tread a lot is like, if you can solve a problem in 10 minutes, it shouldn't take you 30 minutes to do it. Mm. And if you can solve a problem in 10 minutes, it shouldn't, it sh- shouldn't take you, you know, six different 30 minute sessions to do it. It should just take you 10 minutes. And at coaches, like we're not really in a place where we're incentivized to make that our reality, right? Like we want people to come back for more lessons we we need we we literally need people to come back for more lessons so it's it's this kind of unfortunate uh just like it's just the nature of the environment and the industry and and the context that we all live and work in but like our question is well how can we do this better how can we make sure that that like coaches who can solve problems in 10 minutes don't have to spend 30 minutes to solve the problem. Like we should just give them an environment where they can go solve the problem in 10 minutes and now they can go home faster. They can go be with their girlfriends, wives, whoever, uh, just friends faster. They can, they can, you know, go train, they can do their own things. So providing an environment, I mean, to go back to the very first question you asked, like that's a big part of what I'm doing as a director of ops is, is like giving coaches the ability to, to go, you know, do things at a very high level and then not pay the price, uh, like not pay the negative price of doing those things really well. Fantastic. Well, I've got a couple of, of quick hitters before yeah, you go. Let's do it. And, and again, one of the things that, that I, I do want to mention before we do that is uh, I do appreciate your time and I always appreciate uh, your your thought process because again, it, it's, it's very different than mine. So it always challenges me to think about problems in a different way. And, uh, and again, thank you for, for coming on and sharing with us. But the first one is what's something that you've learned lately that you're really excited about? Yeah. Um, I mean, right now, this is March 7th that we're recording this. I'm writing an article on this topic called behavioral externalities. Uh, and it's this idea that your actions shape the social context in which future actions uh, take place. And it kind of sounds a lot like peer pressure, but uh, it's it's not quite you know that simple. Uh, so that's just kind of been the thing that I've been thinking about the last few days. I'm also uh, kind of exploring some different things in golf, and, and uh, as someone who has thrown at, at some higher velocity thresholds, wondering how that can transfer over to golf and and how I can make that happen uh, sustainably and quickly and that's just been fun. It's been fun to explore a different sport that's that's still similar and that has some transferable skills. So I guess that's two things. Uh, but but those have just kind of been the exciting things uh, that I've been thinking about lately. When you're a learner, I think that at some point in our career, we get to the point to where we go, yeah, I didn't do that right. So <laughs> what is something that you have changed your mind about or something that you stopped do- doing because you learned to do something better? Yeah. I think I've changed the way that I think about habits. Uh, so I think, you know, we often talk about how important like good habits are. And I certainly agree that like 
that good habits are, are generally good. Um, but I tend to, to not be as like habit and, and routine oriented as maybe people might expect I am. Uh, you know, I've, I've tried things in the past where like, you know, Hey, I'm going to write every day for 30 minutes. And that worked very early when I was just like getting started writing, but it doesn't really work, uh, as much anymore. Now, you know, and the same thing goes with like working out, you know, I, I have a general idea of the schedule I'd like to follow, but if it just doesn't work out for a week, it's like, Hey, it just doesn't work out. And I, I kind of adjust around that. So, you know, I think, my, you know, I don't have a, ch- I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't have a checklist of like, did I write today? Did I read today? Did I, you know, eat my three square meals? Did I drink enough water? You know, like I don't, I don't do that. I just, I just kind of like live and uh, I actually find it more enjoyable. And like, for example, I know you're kind of familiar with like Nassim Taleb, uh, but I th- just reading his work has been like, it's like reopened me back up to like, what life was like as a child. And it sounds kind of weird to say that, but it's like, I've just realized how you don't really need to be so habitual in everything you do and and how, as long as you like have a general idea of what you're doing, you can kind of just do it and and it all works out. Interesting. I would never have thought that about you. (laughs) What is a drill that your players love that we can steal from you? Yeah. um, That's a good question. I, I think you know, one thing that I've talked with a lot of guys, especially guys with like antiverted hips, uh, is talking about, you know, different like roll in variations. I, I know the roll in has kind of become a, a very popular drill in recent years. You know, you could, you might hear it called the walk, the walk into the roll or, you know, the walk through whatever. There's a lot of different names for it, but, uh, just kind of like understanding some of the, the nuance. Uh, so understanding how maybe like a side hinge. So I, I think of it as like, how can I do a side hinge that that sets me up in the proper position to go throw? And it's it's very relevant uh, for, or it's it's much more applicable for guys who have antiverted hips or or more internally rotated uh, hips, and just like they're just better in internal rotation. And some of the the kind of nuance around that drill of how you can shape it to fit your hip or kind of like your hip anatomy. Uh, that's just something that. I've had some success with guys uh, just kind of explaining things that I figured out as a, you know, an anti-verted hips guy, you know, myself, I just kind of figured this out one day and I've explained it to a few and it, and it's really helped. Uh, so take that for what it's worth, I guess. <laughs> well, I love it. And so just, uh, for the last one I've got is the resource question. So if you could buy one book for everyone listening, what would it be? And before you get started, I've got a couple of them that you already put into. So I want to reiterate those and You've got the Jurgen Klopp biography, and I, I think you you say it differently, Jurgen maybe, uh, which may be the correct pronunciation. Conscious coaching and alchemy, and what uh, would what would you add to that list? Yeah, uh, you know, I think one book that was really formation or kind of really uh, foundational and formational for me was Zero to One uh, by Peter Thiel. I've I've written plenty of articles about that. Um, Another one, I'm just kind of looking back here at my, at my bookshelf. I, you know, I think a good biography is, you know, it really can't be beat. So as much as, you know, it's not going to fit like, hey, here are the three neat takeaways I have from this book, you know, understanding mm-hmm. other people's stories uh, and and then kind of seeing how that fits into where you're at in life, things to avoid, right? Like a good biography often teaches you what things to not do rather than things you should do. You know, and, and for me right now, I'm working through Robert Caro's uh, series on Lyndon B. Johnson. It doesn't really have any direct uh, relation or carry over to what I do on a daily basis. But, you know, you can learn a lot about human psychology and just who people are by, uh, you know, by, by reading a good biography. So I, I guess those are those are two books that uh, a, a book and then a series that have been really, really good. Well, I'm with you on the biographies and I think probably my favorite one is uh, Andre Agassi's. That's probably mm, that was my good. favorite one that I've uh, done in the past year or, or at least comes to mind whenever I think of that. But I'm definitely getting into biographies as well so I can I can uh, second that motion. I, I've got your contact listed in the show notes so if anyone wants to get in touch with you I've got your Twitter and your you know your website linked there. But I did want to leave the mic open for you. So uh, I'm going to mute myself and uh, we're going to mosey on out of here. But is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? 
Yeah, well, I mean, first, I appreciate, you know, you being here. And then, you know, for, for those of you who have listened this far, thank you so much for giving, uh, giving us your last hour or so that's, you know, it, it's not, uh, it's not a cheap investment you just made. And, and hopefully, you know, we were able to help in some way. So appreciate it. Um, you know, if you wanted to get in touch with me, my, my Twitter DMs are always open. Uh, it's T Uh, you can just search me Tanner Reclitus on, on Twitter. Um, and then, you know, my website is tanners.blog, so T-A-N-N-E-R-S dot blog. Uh, there you can sign up for my newsletter. It goes out every single Monday morning at 6 a.m. Eastern. Um, I think you'll find it valuable, valuable but uh, if you don't, you can always unsubscribe and there's no harm in that. So really appreciate it again, uh, Jonathan. You know, thank you. And uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime if, if we're up for that. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which can include Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.